Hello, everyone. Holy mackerel, wasn't this morning? <laughs> this morning was a real, <laughs> a real fun time. Uh, it was a combination of things. It was Chrome doing an update and it wouldn't work with my webcam and it actually crashed my system. So it rebooted and it still wouldn't work. So I had to reboot again and it chose to do a full update. So I even tried to do it on my phone and it didn't work. So I apologize for everyone that showed up this morning, but I'm glad you have shown up now. I've got a whole list of qu uh, questions from the previous chat and uh, from Instagram and from Facebook. So I'll just start with a couple of those before we start with the current ones. So um, somebody asked for a puppy update. <laughs> I did have Mando here a minute ago, but he was hungry and tired, so he's gone home. But he is probably twice the size he, he was a month ago. He is a lively little pup and a delight to have and very, very different from my previous dog. He has my first dog, um, Holly, probably didn't speak for the first two years. And Mando has a vocabulary like you cannot believe. He's got barks and yips and um, whines and everything. It's quite interesting having him around. Um, and somebody asked what projects I was working on. So if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you might have known that I took uh, last weekend, I took the um, uh, Goats in Pajamas uh, workshop with John McPhail of East Art Quilting Company. Uh, and it was a great class. Uh, the technique was with a seams pressed open, which if you follow my channel for a long time, you know I don't like to do, but I did it for this class because that's what was being taught and it was interesting. Um, I'm going to be turning that into a piano, uh, a piano, a pillow, but I'm finding it quite funny how much this looks like my dog. <laughs> so the other thing was I took a step back. Um, I had quilted this, this was a block lotto challenge that I won at my local guild and I had quilted it and absolutely hated it. So I have, um, pulled it all apart. It's going to be a wall hanging. If it was a quilt, I might have let it go. Um, but since it's going to be a wall hanging and I'm looking at it all the time, I pulled it out. It was the wrong thread color. It wasn't necessarily um, the wrong design. It was the wrong thread color. I was trying to make do with what I had and I really didn't like it. So I'm going to redo it again. And this time I'm going to do it with purple thread. And my 4th of July has been on my long arm for the past month, and I have been working hard stitching in the ditch around it. And I am, from there, <laughs> I've taken it off the long arm now because I just need a break from it. And I'm just kind of deciding whether I'm going to do more custom quilting to it like it could be with what it is now I've got a couple of mistakes that I do have to correct but um, not uh, long arming mistakes but piecing mistakes I'm not sure if you know the history of my 4th of July quilt but I started it way 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 back in the beginning when I was a beginner and it is a intermediate quilt so some of my first blocks uh, just need a little bit of adjustment to them because they're very wonky so um I'm going to do that and then it's going to back on my long arm for some more quilting. So that's an update. <laughs> uh, that's the update on my long arm journey. Uh, I don't have as much time to be doing quilting and long arming right at the moment just because my puppy is in that terrible two phase. Uh, he needs a lot of attention when he's awake and his nap times are not long. They're just bursts. So um hoping that it doesn't last too much longer, but I, I know <laughs> the first year is going to be a lot of fun. Um, please ask, can you please describe how to get the points to line up beautifully when sewing two half square triangles together? Well, you get them to line up beautifully when they are the right size and your angle of your half square triangle is on the correct 45 if it's just slightly off 
or your block is at a square or your two squares are not the right size, they're not going to line up properly. So the trick is, I've actually done a video about this, so I don't even need to go into it. Uh, the video is called Making the Perfect Half Square Triangle, and it goes through all the different steps. And the best part of it is the hack to square them up. So take a look at that. Um, Nor has asked, um, I think it's actually Nani, uh, do you wash the newly made quilt or dry clean it before giving it to people? I don't. There are people that do. Uh, some people are quite adamant about doing it, but I have not. And I've never had any complaints. So that's just me right now. Mind you, I've never had, my quilts have not been dirty or anything like that. Like I've never had any of those issues that I've had to deal with, um, with the quilts that I've made. Uh, I'm trying to think like they don't get on the, I don't have any pets. Um, I keep my, my sewing room fairly clean. Um, my floor isn't dusty. So I don't have any of those issues that I need to deal with. And um, I'm just beginning to pre-wash my fabric. So they, some of them have been uh, pre-washed. So there's a, an element of cleanliness to, to begin with. So I just don't. Um, that's my own pref personal preference. There may be a time when I change that. Um, somebody has asked, what type of pen or marker do you use when you have to mark fabric? Ink, felt pen, or chalk? Well, I actually use all three, depending on what I'm doing. So I have a chalk pencil that I use when I'm uh, working with darker fabrics. Um, depending on where the mark needs to be made, I might use a pencil or a Sharpie or whatever. If I do not want it being shown up, I use that washable blue pen. Um, but I often use friction pens. Um, if I'm just making a dot or something like that, I, I will use a friction pen. But friction pens, if they get cold, the, the mark can come back. So just be careful where you're putting that. Um, somebody's asked to add a lattice or not. And I think she's talking about sashing. This is Sharon. Sharon has asked, do you add a lat lattice or not? So sashing is something that is a personal preference of whether you add it or not. If you are making, um, if you are making sampler quilts, they're very good because there, there's just so many different edges to a, um, to a sampler block and they often don't line up properly and it just can help with that discontinuity. Uh, but it's your personal choice. And sashing comes in all shapes and sizes. It comes in all different thicknesses. Um, you can do multicolored. You can do cornerstones. So again, just personal preference. Now, some people also add sashing to make their quilt bigger. So you may have a particular size that you're aiming for. And uh, sashing can make your blocks go farther. So figure out what you want and then make your decision based on that. So I've got people here from all over the world, and I am very appreciative that you showed up for part two. <laughs> it was challenging. Um, Sheila Phelps has asked, uh... <laughs> oh, no, she, she just made this comment. When Karen sees all these questions and answers, she will be as proud as a teacher who leaves the classroom and everybody just gets on with their work instead of throwing paper airplanes away around. Yes. Uh, this morning when I was having difficulty signing on, everybody was just being very supportive of other people answering questions and uh, making it all work. It's just amazing what quilters can do, how um, they work together to help each other. And that's just wonderful to see. Uh, Al would ask for some tips on foundation paper piecing. It's a very, foundation paper piecing is when you have a pattern on paper, it used to be printed on a piece of muslin or things like that. And then you sew your blocks to it and it helps with your accuracy, especially when you're doing um, with pieces of fabric that are on the bias. So some tips. Um, for me, the biggest, once I knew what I was doing, okay, so this is sort of a stage two type thing. 
one of the best things that I started doing was I removed that outer quarter inch from the paper. That's that seam allowance that shows on the paper. And that allowed me to keep the paper on the my blocks longer. I could actually sh sew blocks together and not get that paper trapped underneath my seam allowances. Now you have to remember when you cut your blocks to add that quarter inch, but I found that made a big, big difference for me. Um, I also invested in the add a quarter ruler, um, which also makes a, a difference. But as to beginner, beginner points, before you start sewing a foundation piece, look at where the seams are going to intersect because that is where you need your accuracy. Because when you put those blocks together, those are the points that you're going to have to line up. And so just take a look at where those points are so you're aware of them and those are the points that you nail. The other thing for a beginner would be to fold all your your lines first. It will make the paper a lot easier to deal with. And if you haven't seen my uh, video dollar, uh, sewing hacks from the dollar store part two, uh, I also like to print my foundation paper piecing on newsprint. It's lighter, it's easier to rip off uh, than just photocopy paper. So those are three tips for beginners. Oh, Claire, any tips for, has asked, are there any tips for repairing a quilt? There's so many different types of repairs that are needed. There are seams that come apart. There are holes that appear. Um, there are slices in the fabric. I think I'm actually going to do a video on those because there's just, there's not one answer fits all. So uh, just stay tuned for that. Uh, Matangel asked, why start in the middle of the adding machine paper when using scraps? So if you've watched me, <laughs> watched any of my videos on scraps, uh, you know that I like to sew my very tiny crumbs to adding machine tape. And I start in the middle because then I can add to one side and then I can turn the piece of paper around and add it to the other side and then go to my ironing board to flatten them out. Um, instead of just doing one direction and having to make twice as many trips. So I think I'm going to actually do a video on this because I get so many questions asking about my adding machine uh, blocks that uh, I think it warrants a video. So stay tuned on that too. Charlotte had asked, has asked, where do I get color catchers? I just ordered mine online. I ordered them from Amazon. So just put color catchers in. But I, I there's some local people that have them too. So just keep your eye out. Ah, people are coming from all over the world. Thank you so much for showing up. I just love to see people from everywhere. Greetings from Wisconsin, from Texas. Love the quilt behind me, Kathy McCoy has asked, especially the color choices. This is from my video, um, No Fail Larry Cake, which is my stash buster number six. I had that in my stash for a couple of years and trying to figure out how I was going to make it. And that was my solution. I let symmetry do the hard work. Hello from Ottawa. I'm an Ottawa Valley girl too. So, um, somebody has asked about the classical flannel material. Would it be good for planning a panel? As a tablecloth with flannel back is not a thing in Hungary. I'm not quite sure, Cecilia, what you've asked there. Um, no, I'm trying to figure it out and I'm not quite sure. So um, I'm going to go on to the next one. Um, Donna has asked, for keeping a quilt rolled while machine quilting, what do I use? I've tried the large dollar store hair clips, but I love to find something that's got a better grip. Um, I actually don't roll my quilts anymore when I'm free motion quilting them. Uh, I find it's a little bit too hard to manage, but what I think is really important is 
putting your quilting, make sure you've got a quilt, your quilting gloves on and that will help with the grip. But to roll them up, like I just find that there's too much bulk either in the front or in the back and it, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to keeping it smooth. I took a class with Jackie Gehring a couple of years ago and you know she does some exceptional um, walking foot quilting. Her, uh, She's got two books, walk one and walk two. And she um, talks about just piling the quilt up in front of you. And she says, just make a ledge on your chest and just manage it that way. And again, use those gloves to give you that extra grip to help you. So that's the, the method that I've been using lately. Um, somebody has asked, how's my new long arming going? Um, I answered that question right at the beginning. So just go to the beginning of the chat and ask there. Um, who are my go-to YouTubers? Um, I don't actually watch a lot of quilting YouTube videos. Uh, one is time, time management. Um, I will drop in on Sugary Dew. I will drop in on Missouri Creek and Jordan Fabrics and Fat Quarter Shop, you know, the big ones. Um, there's some other ones. There's Tiny Orchard. Um, Katcha Vachi has a couple of cute ones. Um, trying to think of, you know, they're very driven by what I need to know, like most people. Uh, so um, I've been watching a little bit of Lori Holt lately and always on Instagram, I will watch Tula Tuesdays, uh, time, at least the beginning of her episode. So those are the ones I watch. Oh, uh, Shaky is actually is making a baby quilt with minky on the back. Should she bind with cotton or minky? My advice would be to bind with cotton. It's just so much easier to handle and a lot less bulk to deal with. And you don't have to deal with any stretchiness. So that's what I would do. Uh, Karen has asked, when putting on borders, where should you put the seam when you have to join border pieces? Um, I... I put this normally in the bottom of my quilt, but you can put the joins anywhere you want. I did a quilt um, a couple of weeks ago. This Here it is. Um, and I pieced my binding. So my joins actually lined up with a block because they were too toned. So it's if it's all one color, it really doesn't matter where you... You put it, but it's easy to handle if you put it in the middle of the bottom. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> J.E. has asked, any tips to speed up flying geese? I did a whole video on flying geese on how to make them and uh, how to best use your fabrics for them. So go take a look at my inventory of my library of videos and look for flying geese. You'll find it. Um, what size brand of hoop would you recommend for a new quilter? I don't do any hand quilting. So I would recommend starting with one of the small ones. So uh, you get the hang of what you're doing and whether you feel, whether you like it. And that's the one I see most commonly used. So it's probably not a bad idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> Catherine has asked, do you, I do free motion quilting and how long did it take for you to get comfortable with it? So with free motion quilting, it's all about muscle memory. So not only do you have to know what it looks like, you have to be able to move your body smoothly to make it, but you've got to have it visualized in your head before you can translate it into your hands. So there's always some shape that each person is more comfortable with. Maybe you like to do loops. Maybe you like to do straight lines. Maybe you like to do circles. Um, so think of what you like to doodle, and that's probably the easiest thing to start with. But I do know this. Practice makes you better. Practice not only with doodling, but practice um, with practice pieces, and it does get better. Um, take a look at your, your posture. You know, you want to be at the right height. You don't want to be 
jerking your machine around. Make sure you're wearing quilting gloves so you keep some of the tension out of your hand. And if I can offer you any advice <laughs> is to be slower than you think you should because so many videos are done sped up and it's a much slower process than you think. Um, I think I did a video on 10 free motion quilting mistakes and trying to do it way too fast. Take the time to re uh, place your hands, understand that if my hands are like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the distance for you. You may be more comfortable here. Um, so just, and understand how your machine works. So uh, start off with the shapes that you're more comfortable with and then move into those other ones. I found I was a lot more comfortable with meanders before I was comfortable with loops and go from there. Um, it, it's not easy. Like <laughs> we all think we're going to just sit down and it's going to be nice and easy and we're going to be able to recreate what other people do just because the doodling of it is a little bit easy. And just be patient, just be patient. And it's always looks worse in front of you than it does once you get the binding on. So just persevere and uh, it will come. Um, <laughs> lots of activity going on in the chat here. Uh, greetings from Annapolis, Maryland. Hello, Elaine. Uh, Angela, Catherine, Ingrid. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what size of your machine that you free motion quilt on. I know people that do it on featherweights. So, uh, again, it's not about the machine. Do you have any tips for how to put Ada cloth blocks in a quilt? Should I fuse them to a backing fabric first? So Ada cloth is what people use for cross stitching. And unfortunately, I don't I don't have a lot of experience doing that. So it's going to be again based on the weight of your fabric and I would think that you would want something very lightweight fused to the back just to secure all your embroidery threads. So that's the way I would go. I would take something very um, soft, like Misty Fuse. Is it Misty Fuse? Flexi Fuse? Or uh, Steam to Seam Light and use those. Um, any pattern suggestions for lots of plaid fabrics? This is Sandy. Um, plaids are very busy. So you want to take advantage of the directional elements in them. So uh, I would just keep it simple. I would keep it simple. If you're going to accentuate just one direction of the plaid, I did a video on stripes. There's all sorts of interesting ways that you can do it. Um, but I would honestly, if they're old, if they're old, um, like old shirts and things like that, I would be inclined just to do squares and let them speak for themselves and uh, make it very scrappy. That's the way I would go. Carol, what are my favorite scrap quilts? Um, so there's two ways of looking at a scrap quilt. Scrap quilts can be improv, where you're just combining scraps together, and scraps can be in you know, four patches or any block. And you can just make your quilt out of lots of different blocks that are made out of lots of different fabrics. So I love all scrap quilts. Um, I don't think there's any particularly better one than the other. It's just, uh, I do like crumb quilts though. And, you know, I, I see them all the time and they're all, I just love that busyness of a scrap quilt. So I can't choose a favorite. Uh, Phyllis has asked, who will I be interviewing next? I have two people. Um, I've got lots of people coming up. Um, uh, my very next one is with Ursula McClintock of LDH Scissors, and she's going to be talking about what we need to know about scissors and how to care for them. Um, coming up in the future, I have the Colorblind Quilter. I have a woman who makes quilts for foster children who are um, aging out of the system. I have uh, John McPhail, East Art Quilting, 
company, I have Kathy Hay, uh, not a quilter, but a big bodacious. <laughs> we're talking about big bodacious goals. Uh, I've got Barbara Brackman, who has just released the the big Bible of all the um, all the quilting blocks. And if you've got anybody else that you want me to interview, just send me a, an email at info, just get it done quilts.com and I'll look into it. Anna has asked, any advice on what information to include when gifting a quilt? What advice do you think I should give the recipient? Um, well, I think, first of all, you should start off with... Um, your story of making the quilt. I think you should provide the story of how you made your choices, why you thought the quilt was good for them. Um, what do you think is how, how the quilt aligns with their personality or their life story. Um, and then of course, if they're, they're interested in the cleaning instructions, you can provide that. But I think the story of how you made the quilt is much more important. So that's what I would be sure to provide. And you can do that in a label, you can do that in a, um, an attachment, or uh, you can do it in person. So I think it's important to have the, that story. And maybe the intention of what you thought the quilt would be used for. Is this a wall hanging? Is this for your bed? Or is this something that you can take camping with you? So those are the type of things. Um, if it's not precious, like an ugly quilt or something like that, make sure they know that. And everyone, I get a lot of people complaining that I use the term ugly. Make sure, <laughs> I hope you know that I, that the ugly is in quotations. <laughs> uh, Doris has, I have a quilt for, to fix for a friend that was made by her grandmother. The corner has been burnt off. What do you recommend? Well, I'm not quite sure how much of the corner is burnt off. Um, but the quilt is the memory, right? So making it square again isn't necessarily important. What you're trying to do is to prevent further damage. So if it's only an inch or so, um, I would just maybe um, rebind it. Uh, just take a curve off the uh, curve off the quilt, and that burning off of the corner can be part of the story. Um, I know that I have done for people who have been given grandmother quilts, I have cut them in four and rebound them so that they can, it could be distributed amongst the grandchildren. So uh, it's what she intends, is she intending to keep it for a bed quilt? Then I would just save as much as I could and rebind it. Uh, you get into all sorts of different problems with old quilts with new material because they're going to wash differently, they're going to handle differently, and I, without seeing it and without knowing the whole story behind it, I would just save as much of it as possible and rebind it. Uh, Jody has asked, what is the most exciting project that I'm working on? Well, I am... I interviewed Angie Wilson of Gnome Angel a couple of weeks ago and got talking with her. And one of my goals this year was to use up some of my tulip pink fabric that I have uh, accumulated over the last number of years. And I am really looking forward to making her 100 day, 100 block challenge quilt, her kinship fusion sampler. Um, I've got the pattern. I, got the fussy um, block rulers and just figuring out how best I'm going to use up those tulip pink fabrics within that quilt. I saw a fabulous finished version of this. Robin Pickens put it on her Facebook, uh, her Instagram feed this week. And you know, Robin Pickens, her colors are that tomatoey red and uh, a nice limey green that I like so much. But she also has a lot of yellow and orangey yellow and greeny yellow. And the majority of her quilt 
was the green with the versions of gray. And then she had these spots of color. And I realized, you know what? I think that's what I want to do. I want to make it mostly one color and then just highlights of other ones. And uh, so now I'm getting out my, my, uh, my crayons and I'm coloring it. And so I really like the planning phase. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, Dee Dee has asked, what do I think of modern Irish chains? I'm not even sure what modern Irish chains are. Let me just throw that into Google here. Modern Irish chains. Hmm. Some of them are quite pretty. Um, you can make anything modern by just using brighter colors and just having a modern layout, you know, doing what's popped up on my feed is like rainbow feeds and things like that. So um, they're actually, you know, Irish chains are like four patches or nine patches combined together. And those are really good for uh, beginner quilters or quilters that are working on those basic foundational skills. You may be a little bit more advanced, but want to go back and work on some precision. And uh, yeah, that would be a fun, a fun way to use up scraps. It would be a fun way just to challenge yourself. So go for it. Tamara has asked, she's, uh, she's quilting on a budget and wondering if she can use an old blanket as batting. Yes, you can. Uh, that's what, uh, our grandmothers and our great -grandma grandmothers did. Uh, they just took old blankets and, or even old quilts and just put new covers on them. So you can definitely do that. <laughs> what is my favorite thing to do? Totally unrelated to anything, sewing, quilts, or gardening. Well, I don't do much gardening anymore. Um, but I do like to read and I do like I used to watch a lot of movies and uh, analyze them, but I don't do that so much anymore. I certainly enjoy spending time with my family. Um, but I've combined two, two of my big loves, and that is storytelling and quilting in my YouTube channel. So I think I do love ancestry. Uh, looking at genealogy and looking at my family roots, but I can lose a week so fast. Like I can put my nose, um, I get searching after a relative and uh, some obscure uh, information about it. And I can start digging and digging and digging. And, you know, I can, <laughs> my husband will come in and say, are you thinking of eating sometime soon? Because <laughs> I can just lose a whole day or weeks even looking for information. And that leads to something else. And that leads to something else. So I really love ancestry. And I really do love um, calligraphy. But I lose it. I lose it because I don't do it very much. Um, so I love letter writing and um, just practicing with letters and scripts and things like that. But these days, you know, there's just so little place that I even write, uh, let alone practice calligraphy. So those would be my two things. Mary, am I making any spring themed quilts? I don't really work with winter, spring, summer themes. I do know that I've got some fabric um, that I'm hoping that I'll make eventually a Halloween quilt. I've got some pennant Halloween things. I know I have some Christmas, I've got a Christmas quilt that I want to make. Um, but I don't actually work through color themes. And spring colors are really not my colors. My colors are much more fall oriented or winter oriented. Um, you know, I really like those bright, bold, um, and slightly dark colors. So sp spring, those palettes of those pastels, it just doesn't, I can work with it very in small amounts, but I cannot work with it in a, a lot of colors. Like even this one that I just showed you, um, this, this quilt turned out so much lighter than I thought it would. I thought the, the blues would make it so much darker. Um, yeah. So I have difficulty when they, when things go too light on me. Uh, Sorry, uh, 
Marianne has asked, is it realistic to hope to achieve the same great quilting stitches that long arm quilting does when I'm free motion quilting on my sewing machine? I wonder if I will always be disappointed with my results. Um, yes, it is possible to get good results, but you just have to be patient with yourself and understand that it's a, a slower process. Um, I think the biggest difference between free motion quilting and long arming is the speed. You know, um, you got to make that quilt sandwich, which takes time, and you got to manage that, and that takes time. And it's just so much more physically taxing on you that you can only take it in bites. Um, and then we, if we're anxious, you know, you want to push it. You want to push it harder. But, you know, there's people like Peter Byrne, uh, who won QuiltCon 2020. He did all of those on sit-down machines. So, um the technique, you got to practice, you know, it really comes down to practicing and building up your, your um, skill level. So if you're always practicing on big quilts, you know, if that's the time when you free motion quilt, you may not be getting the practice in that you want. Um, so make your, make some practice pieces that you do every day and build those things up and work on wall hanging size quilts and lap type size quilts before you think that you're going to get those wonderful results on a king size because you know there's challenges it's just with everything you just have to be patient with your skill yeah um how old were, was i when i made my first quilt hand or machine style uh my first finished quilt i'm was past 50 <laughs> <laughs> I had started five quilts before I turned around and made the Jelly Roll Jam Quilt from Fat Quarter Shop. I just wanted to have something quickly finished. And my next two or three came in after that fairly quickly, um, just because I had been working on them for so many years and finally they were done. Uh, yeah, I didn't. Do there was a quilt that I made with my daughter much younger. Uh, so I guess I was either in my late 30s or early, early 40s. She had done a project for her 100th day. They used to, in, in school, they used to celebrate the, the 100th day and she had been doing a pioneer um, unit at school. So we took some old shirts of my husband's and we cut them up and made a quilt out of that. And she didn't know how to sew, so I was supervising her. So I don't know whether we consider that her quilt or my quilt. I know I, I probably did the binding on it by hand and things like that for her. So maybe a little bit earlier. <laughs> but I did sew. I was an experienced sewer before I started quilting. And that had it, has had its own challenges in switching over. What type of fabric would you put on a picnic quilt? quilt dark colors or cotton um I would use cotton um I use just my regular quilting cottons on picnic quilts all the time um I just for a picnic quilt you're just looking for something that's um not too fiddly because it's going to be washed a lot right so uh, you can use your scrap quilts you can make an ugly quilt you can just do a simple keep it simple keep it simple who is my favorite designer? Charmaine, I think. Uh, Charmaine has asked, who is my favorite designer? I'm not one for having ultimate favorites, but some of my favorites are Kathy Doherty um, from Material Obsessions, I believe is her store. Uh, I like Tim Holtz. He does, uh, he's had a number of lines like correspondence and eclectic elements. Um Tula Pink, there's always, though the, her last couple of collections haven't been my favorite just because I, I'm not a, a person who likes to sew with black and white, but the one that she just showed the other day that's coming up with her flamingos, I mean, I love that. Just absolutely love those colors and everything in it. So, um, but there's other ones that you just, I can... I'm attracted always to coordinating fabric. I get sucked in with color harmonies. You see those fat quarters standing in a pile and I can get sucked into just the, the drama of those, those colors working together. So uh, no problem 
I can sew with anybody's. I can um, get attracted to anybody's, but uh, those, those particular designers, those would be my favorite. Uh, Jacqueline has said her brother-in-law has passed and has been given shirts and ties to make a memory quilt. She's very new to quilting and don't know where or how to start. Can I offer any tips? Well, um, my first memory quilt, I was given all sorts of knitted shirts to do. Um, the most important thing is you need to get some very lightweight interfacing and reinforce all those stretchy things. Uh, silk ties, they're all sewn on the bias, so you also want to secure them. Um, be realistic about what you can do. Uh, if you're just brand new to it, you may not want to do the ties. Um, and it's really important for you to sit down with the people that you're making it for and find out which ones are their favorites, uh, which ones have the memories for them. Um, because those are the ones that you want to highlight. It's not necessary that you put everything in the quilt. Maybe you just highlight a couple. I know I made, for this one person, I made four quilts and we decided on what shirts would go in which quilt. My first one, I'm not sure, I made on my own and afterwards I realized that not, may not necessarily been what she was looking for. And then I made a, a couple of pillows for the parents out of, you know, I, I put a couple of pants, had pockets in them. But again, you should go back and find out what were the, the pieces of clothing that had the most memory for them. And sometimes you don't need to do anything fancy. You know, you're just make, cutting out the, the fancy, uh, if it's a t-shirt, the logo in it. Um, for if it's a button down shirt, maybe you just make a pillow with the button down and the collar still in it. You know, there's lots, there's lots of different people who have made these online. So uh, definitely take a look through YouTube on the how to's on how to make a memory quilt. Yeah. Janice has asked, should repairs be attempted on a hundred year old quilt or just use it as a decor piece? Well, <laughs> I again, it's up to your situation on a hundred year old quilt. Like, are there memories attached to it? Um, is it something that brings you joy? Are there colors in it that you really want to preserve? Uh, because the the wearing of it is part of the story. So if you're just wanting to have it um, on display where people can refer to it, um, I would not attempt the repairs. But then some rep some quilts are, are, are in terrible shape and you're wanting to keep using it. So there's different, there's just no one answer. So take a look at, just find out what you want to use it for. Are you wanting to preserve that memory and the stitch work? Because there's a lot of story and history in all that workmanship. And um, it will be very obvious if you repair it. So maybe it's better as a historical piece, but you will know that. And you might want to talk to an appraiser in your neighborhood um, or nearby or to, to answer those questions for you, whether how much value it really does have. Um, I just want to recognize a Sue Pfeiffer. Thank you for your donation. Uh, uh, let me see. And I think that's possibly all we have for today. Um, if you haven't watched it, I thank you all for showing up. Boy, there's just everybody, just so many people here. And I just appreciate you all in your community. Uh, cut your own leg, uh, just see if there's any last one. Nope. Everybody from Chatham, Ontario, from Nebraska. Just thank you so much. Do I have any sewing or quilting quotes? Well, the first time I heard it, I think it's not necessarily hers, but Angela Walters told me, if you cannot see a mistake from 20 paces on a moving horse, don't worry about it. I like that one. I always like finished is better than perfect. But those are ones that you've seen a lot. Um, the one that I always tell people is eat the frog first. <laughs> 
I have it on my mugs, <laughs> have it on my mugs. Um, and that just basically means uh, do the thing that you least want to do first. And sometimes you have to break that down into smaller steps um, to get through, but you spend so much time worried about it and thinking about it and procrastinating that if you get the thing that you don't want to do done first, then you have so much more time to do the things that you do want to do. So um, I know that my 4th of July quilt, I spent 100 days doing it 30 minutes at a time, and it eventually gets done. And I have a couple of tax problems, not problems, I've got to do some filings, and I've been avoiding them because... I can't do this thing without doing the next thing. And I can't do that until I do this. And I can't do that until I do this. And it's become this big issue. And I just realized I've just got to attack it 30 minutes at a time. So break it down into smaller steps. And that's what I'm doing. So anyways, thank you all for showing up on this Saturday afternoon. It, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's been quite a journey today. And I thank Taylor, who is uh, remote, helping me answer these questions and helping direct you to the videos that might help you. I have Brandy here this morning also helping out, but she is spending the weekend with her family. So she was not available this afternoon, but I thank her as well for helping out. Uh, if you haven't caught it, I released a video yesterday on four fast and easy gifts that you can do with fabric and frames, uh, four different ways you can make them. If you have more time, you can be more elaborate. But this, if we got Mother's Day coming up, um, you may have some graduation gifts coming up that you just want to do something fast and quick, and you can use your big hero prints to do them with. Um, I also did an interview with Valerie Goodwin on Karen's Quilt Circle last week. She makes these amazing map quilts and it's an excellent interview. She's an amazing woman, an amazing quilter. Uh, so check that out. And uh, yeah, uh, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, you can always sign up for my newsletter at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. And I have lots of free downloads from the Stash Buster quilts to some color theory uh, diagrams and charts. So take a look there. If you are watching this in uh, at a later date, uh, the videos that we were referencing, um, just please, uh, you'll probably find them in the notes below. Um, I want to thank uh, Jane McCord also for her super chat. Thank you so much. So take care and I will see you next month. Um, somebody just quickly has asked, what is my schedule for live chats or uploads? I try to upload a regular video every Thursday, Friday, sometimes Saturday, depending on my timing. And I do Karen's Quilt Circle on the second and fourth Monday of the month, and I do the Q&As on the first weekend. So that's my schedule. So take care. Have a good day.